Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me here. This is a huge honor because a few years ago, I was usually sitting on that side of the room. Um, and I used to come to EE380 to watch basically like the heroes of computing come over and like talk. And like, I don't belong here, I really don't. Uh, I think maybe in like a few decades, like four or five, perhaps I might earn like a, slow, a small mention, but really thank you for having me here. I'll at least use the, uh, the venue to talk about uh, the future of the web because it is really important to get this right. Um, we've come to depend on the web more than almost any other uh, technology, at least when it comes to international communications and infrastructure. Um, and it could, be, uh, it could be in danger. Uh, at least uh, we've encount we're encountering some problems uh, that we should fix. All right, so this, the way I'm going to structure this talk is that I will be giving a, a pretty comprehensive overview of the problems that brought about the, um, or the problems that IPFS tries to solve. Uh, then I'll discuss the protocol in detail. I'll actually talk about IPFS in general. Uh, and then I'll talk about the project uh, from a meta perspective of how you go about building open source uh, protocols to try and patch the living system that we have that is the internet. And uh, I'll, I'll also, uh, at the end, kind of, uh, so I have this presentation with a whole bunch of slides, but at the end, I'll, I'll go through a set of principles uh, in terms of like lessons learned as you go about building systems and uh, give, a, give way to a, like a, a discussion around how protocol development should perhaps happen, um, what are some critical pieces of uh, what, some critical principles when you go about building protocols to make sure that the thing gets adopted. So switching costs is one of them. Uh, there's a bunch of others that we've uh, had to struggle with and had to think through carefully uh, to make sure that what we make is actually used instead of you know, become part of the pile of cool, amazing technology that goes absolutely nowhere. Um, so yeah, uh, that's kind of the whole thing. And at the end, I kind of will open up for questions and can really dive into whatever people uh, want to talk about. All right, so IPFS. This talk is, is called you know, the Distributed Permanent Web, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Merkle Web. Uh, because it, it really, like when you think about Merkle links, and I'll describe how those work, they kind of solve almost everything. Uh, not exactly, but, but it's a really important property that I just wish uh, had been uh, put into the web from the beginning. And uh, funnily enough, uh, I think the timing was such that they could have been put from, into the web from the beginning, they just weren't. And uh, if only uh, that had happened, the, the world today would be pretty different. So IPFS, uh, we like calling it the distributed web, or the permanent web, or the Merkle web, in honor of Ralph Merkle, who came up with Merkle links. And it's really a protocol to upgrade how the web works. And the goal is to make something that doesn't change the interface, meaning that if, if you do anything that will cause people to have to mutate, or to change how they think about their application system, it's never going to be deployed uh, because people just won't uh, switch to it, as we were discussing. So we're matching the interface that people already expect. Uh, there will be some things you can do uh, with some more advanced features, but the goal is to get uh, web developers and web application creators to just be able to layer whatever it is they're building today on top of IPFS. And just if nobody knows that there's been a switch, then we've won because the internet should be upgraded that way. Uh, where the end user should never have to think about uh, programs changing or having to install anything else. It should just get better. Uh, and IPFS stands for the Interplanetary File System. And uh, this is a specific choice uh, as an homage to JCR Licklider, who when he created the ARPANET, or he had the ideas for the ARPANET, what eventually turned into the ARPANET, um, called it the Intergalactic Network. And that just sort of sets the, uh, the ambition of the original internet project, right? Like, we're talking about a network that should operate at an intergalactic scale. And that was the idea. Let's take all of these small pieces, um, all of these networks that are use case specific, um, and bind them together with this overlay network uh, that we're going to call the, the intergalactic network. And now everything is going to be able to talk to everything else. And that's pretty much been true. I mean, today, 
all the devices are connecting through the internet and are able to talk to each other from those, these very simple design principles. Now, what does it mean to think about file distribution in that kind of scale? Uh, one of the first things that you, interplanetary sort of brings up is we're now moving data across planets. Uh, there you run into serious issues when you think about latency. Uh, and it turns out that that's the same kind of problem that emerges when you think about moving data from the data center uh, to users in, say, like developing countries or um, really slow networks. And you end up with different constant factors, of course, but the problem is the same. When in the data center you're dealing with things at the microsecond or millisecond scale, uh, when you move out to the edges of the network, you're dealing with seconds and minutes. And that is that kind of a difference is the same as communicating over short, you know, distances uh, here on Earth versus communicating over distances to something like Mars. So the claim is that we should be building uh, the internet and the file distribution system for the internet, i.e. the web, in such a way that it should work uh, when we consider cases like interplanetary travel. Um, right, so that's, that's a, so the name IPFS, uh, tries to encapsulate all of this is on a master lick lighter and puts it into people's minds that we really mean business when we say this thing should work across these massively long distances. Uh, cool. So, all right. So this is uh, uh, Paul Byron's uh, first categorization of networks. And I like using this image because it shows how um, the, the differences in, in a, the structure of a network can have vast implications in the, in the uses of the protocols, right? So when we think about centralized architectures, it's pretty easy to change. You just go and change one thing, and you can upgrade things very quickly. Uh, but it centralizes power in one location. And so the end users may not be able to have the same kind of capabilities. When we talk about decentralized uh, networks, these uh, we've now kind of sharded the responsibilities of the center node, uh, and we could potentially have a network that's more resilient, uh, that perhaps could deal with some failures, but still, uh, it, you don't have full, um, the same level of resiliency that you could get if everything spoke the same protocol. Uh, and so in the distributed case, when everything is peer-to-peer, -peer, when everything can talk to everything else, when every single node is running the exact same code, uh, or at least is able to speak the same protocol, now you're talking about an extremely resilient fabric that you can cut in any, any kind of shape, uh, and the thing should still work. Uh, for the most part, the web started in the distributed world. Um, you know, the, the original idea was that you would have your own HTTP server and your own HTTP client, and you would both serve files and browse the web. But today, it's not really the case. It's kind of centralized completely. Um, you have browsers that talk to servers, and you maybe create content that way. Uh, but ev all your interactions, or most interactions, are mediated through this uh, central central point. right? And this is kind of distributed across, or rather federated across different organizations or different web websites. But for the most part, when you deal with one kind of system, you're completely centralized. That's an issue. Uh, so. Why does this matter, right? Like, uh, why should we try and make the web more distributed? At, at the end of the day, the internet today is kind of like this nervous system that we have, right? So humanity uh, invented this technology, and we've now become so dependent on it, and we use it for everything to the point where it really is the nervous system that we're evolving together. And the web, um, actually, I'll go into that in a second. And, and the internet, the amazing thing is that it's just a collection of protocols, right? It's just a whole bunch of really good ideas implemented and deployed uh, that made the whole thing work and scale. And it's actually a remarkable feat of engineering and design from the get-go to sort of construct an architecture that would scale to the use today. And I, I always, uh, I actually love the fact that we're still running IPv4. Of course, I would love to switch to IPv6, but I actually love the fact that IPv4 has, has gotten us here and is still in use today. Uh, that's pretty amazing. You can't say the same thing about most other protocols. And again, like the, the great idea was to create this, this thin waste uh, to try and, and allow the lower layers of the network to evolve and also allow the upper layers of the network to evolve separately and only have this very small protocol in between that will mediate how the whole network will grow. Kind of basics. But the cool thing about the internet is that you can just, you, you can change it and you can make it better by coming up with good ideas. You take these ideas and if they're good enough, you then write specs, you turn those specs into code, you deploy them into computers, and you enhance humans. 
right? And this is very real. Think about your daily life. Think about how much you use applications that uh, augment your abilities through software that's connected to other software elsewhere. And think about how many of those applications were built by people that you know, didn't have the capabilities to just build this massive infrastructure. They just wrote some code and deployed it to you. And now you have it. And now you have a superpower. Uh, this is a, a remarkable uh, kind of technology. right? Like this, It didn't necessarily have to be this way. It could have been completely mediated by powers that be. But for whatever reason, or rather by clever design and engineering, we today have this internet that is upgradable in a fantastic way, right? Where any kind of person, you know, like the, the quintessential college kids in their dorm room uh, can come up with the best idea or like some great idea, deploy into the network and suddenly build um, something massive and create tons of value for the world. And then the cycle kind of looks like this, right? You have some research, you then uh, develop it into code, you deploy it, and then people use it. And it's, it's this, um, it's in this, in this uh, sequence that sometimes problems happen. Uh, many people, uh, so there's a ton of research that happens. And when you think about uh, what academia knows, we're basically like 15 or 20 years ahead of what's deployed and in use today. And that to me is pretty sad because what it suggests is that it's really kind of like a, like a lazy development and lazy development um, process in that we, we know what's right to build, just nobody has done it. And in a big way, IPFS is really just an integration of old ideas. It's taking good ideas that have been known about for a long time and trying to upgrade the current internet by developing them, uh, making sure that the interfaces make sense, deploying them to the whole network, and making them easy to use for developers, programmers, and end users. Uh, so, why does a web matter? So we, we know about the internet, it's like this amazing uh, piece of technology, but what, what is the web really? How is it different from the internet? The web is this application platform that allows you to write these pieces of software and put them on this amazing um, interconnected nervous system, and it's what actually gives you the capabilities. It's these applications that give you the superpowers. It's not necessarily the communication. Sure, you could potentially write some bits, but the end user is not going to you know, sit and write a protocol and try to communicate with somebody else, the end user is just going to use some application deployed through uh, something like the web. And just think about in your day-to-day -day life how much of what you do across all verticals of your life, from learning to communicating with your colleagues to communicating with your loved ones to maintaining your personal relationships, how much of that work is now done through internet protocols in general and specifically the web. So the, the point is that the properties of the web have vast implications in your capabilities as a human being, which means that if there's some problems with the web, we better fix them, because uh, it might mean trouble for people. And lo and behold, there are some problems with the web. As I discussed earlier, uh, it's kind of centralized now, and that's you know, a source of problems. But it all kind of boils down to some design decisions that mostly have to do with location addressing. And this made a lot of sense at the time. Location addressing is just the idea of saying, when you have a, some resource placed on the web, you address it with the IP address of the host that contains the resource. This was great at the time. It made, act, made the web actually work, finally. Uh, there have been many hypertext systems in the past for decades before. And it was actually this idea that made it scale very quickly. Uh, so this was a great idea at the time. But location addressing has a problem, which is that in a network where the same file might exist in many places, only a specific host or you know, virtual host, it could be multiple computers pretending to be one, uh, only one specific host can actually serve you the file. Uh, that's because that is the authority of the content. Uh, if you try to get it from somewhere else, you couldn't know that it's the same thing. Uh, so you specifically have to go and talk to that host to retrieve the data. Uh, to sort of illustrate this, imagine that we're kind of in this room, uh, and I were to share a picture to Facebook, uh, and a, a web application, and I sent you a link, and now all of you would have to go and talk to Facebook to pull down the image. And so that is when you kind of look at it in the network, uh, I upload some image over to Facebook. I hand you a link. Now 30 people go and make a request and pull down the image. 
which is slow and a huge waste of bandwidth. Perhaps the web could be structured in a different way to make use of the fact that perhaps the image is sitting right here in this computer and you could get it. And images are not that big of a deal. We have a lot of bandwidth these days, but think about video. If, uh, if there's a, a 200 megabyte video, which is actually pretty common these days, uh, we could be wasting you know, something like to the tune of 48 gigabytes just by sharing one video uh, across these links. Uh, we took a, a, uh, a number of views from, from Gangnam Style, which is, I think, the most viewed video. Uh, yeah? Are you including overhead bits with packets with that? Uh, no, no, no. This is just raw data, right? Like, of course, there's all sorts of other stuff that go into it. Yeah, but arguably, you could uh, squeeze out. Like, these are kind of constant factors that get added. It's more about like, the order um, uh, to deal with here. This is just kind of illustrating how much bandwidth we're really losing. Uh, something like Gangnam Style has been viewed to the tune of like almost or over two billion times, and when you just when you count just the data coming out of Google servers, let alone all the links, we're dealing with something close to 500 petabytes of data. That's a lot for a video, right? I mean, this is clearly an issue. There's no reason we should be moving around all of this data constantly through the network. And I wonder how many of those people actually saw the same video multiple times in the same day through different tabs that might have caused the, the content to move again. Caching is not perfect. HTTP caching was sort of invented as a way to deal with this problem, but in reality, it doesn't work most of the time. And the security model kind of precludes caching most of the time, right? So you can't actually use in network in between caching because uh, if you want privacy and security in the internet, you have to armor the wire, which means you're back to the same problem again, where you have to move the data all the way. Uh, problem. So, Another issue around bandwidth is that it's not increasing very fast. So this is a graph showing the average connection speed uh, of the G7 countries. And this is from 2007 to 2012. And the average connection speed hasn't increased as much as other things like processing power or, or storage. Uh, in fact, the prices, when you, when you graph the prices of uh, decreasing over time, bandwidth is decreasing in price slower than storage. What this means is that, in a sense, we get this impression that the capacity uh, of the, the storage capacity is outpacing the speed at which we can move around data in the network, giving us the impression that the network is getting slower. So, bandwidth could be getting better, our speeds could be getting better, but because our disks are increasing in size faster and we're using media that's ever and ever larger, we get the feeling that the network is actually getting slower. This gets worse when you think about developing countries and the number of people that are coming online all the time. And you're now in like these ed networks at the edge of the, of, the, of the internet that have really high latencies, slow ban uh, small bandwidth. And then you have websites that try to give them you know, tens or, or, or dozens of megabytes uh, just to load a web page, and they're completely locked out of the internet. And so these amazing capabilities that we were discussing, about bef discussing before, all the software that you can deploy, suddenly can't reach the end user in the network. Um, and that's a big issue when you think about the people out there that need the internet most, the people that we kind of discuss and say, let's go and, and create all this great software to deploy it and kind of equalize the, the, the disparity of wealth across the world, and ends up being locked out for, by stupid issues like latency and bandwidth. Like that should not be, that should not prevent uh, people from accessing the network. And uh, recently uh, there was, so there's this huge uh, immigrant crisis right now. Uh, there's a huge refugee crisis in, uh, in Europe right now. There's all these camps being set up. And there's reports that people have food, they have clothes, and so on. But what they don't have is bandwidth. Uh, they can't actually talk to, to their loved ones. They can't find each other because they don't have the capability to be able to communicate with each other. And so there's this kind of like insane situation where something so simple uh, is blocking people. Uh, latency, of course, is like the, the bane of computer networks, which is that you can't go faster than the speed of light problems. And so the solution is try and spread the content everywhere. So here's kind of like the Amazon data centers and the Google data centers spread all over the world to try and get you content faster. But that's only those companies. What about everybody else? Everybody, who, everybody else in the network should be able to have capabilities like this, but the design structure of the internet precludes it. And sure, you could hire them to, to serve it, but it is possible that you may end up not being able to use these, these systems. Uh, it, it turns out, by the way, that this picture kind of elucidates all the problems here. Uh, 
There's another set of use cases that the web is mostly, um, mostly has ignored so far, which is what happens when you deal with disconnected or offline operation. And so again, in this case, if I send you a Google Doc and we start all collaborating in the same, same thing, and it's amazing, we're sharing all this data, uh, it's kind of silly that we have to move the updates through the backbone to some server out there and shipping them back here when we now have really sophisticated algorithms that can do um, you know, smart conflict-free resolution that allows us to collaborate in real time, and yet we're still moving all the updates to the backbone. Right? This is very silly. And it gets worse when you think about the network falling apart. So if our uplink were to, fall, uh, to go offline, we lose the capability of working together completely, let alone um, you know, we should be able to continue working because we're in the same room, we are in the same portion of the network, we should continue uh, having this capability, and yet we don't. And uh, there's actually a lot of important uh, sort of infrastructure tools uh, that are out there, or infrastructure applications, that basically fall apart in this kind of scenario. Or you have to work really hard to make sure that you as a user are protected against this, this problem. There are kind of caches of Wikipedia that you could download, but for the most part, most links will fall apart. This is something that the web can and should fix. Uh, and we, I actually think this is completely unacceptable, right? Like, uh, I want to live in a world where the applications that I use will continue working um, whether or not I'm in the best place in the network. Um, I recently took a trip through Europe, and I was surprised to find that in the trains between cities, the latency got so bad on mobile that I just got locked out of many websites. Just the, the latency was so high that the round trip times for the, uh, the crypto handshake would just time out. And suddenly I couldn't do anything. Or like turn off HTTPS, right? And this is really, really silly. Uh, so, so I sort of see it as this. Like you have this, this mothership uh, that is kind of controlling everything and like you, you lose access to the mothership and everything falls apart. And we need to as engineers and as designers of applications and as builders, get out of this huge problem. Um, and uh, the thing is, like, it, you don't have to even think about full uh, disconnection. Sometimes low bandwidth blocks you out, interference between wireless networks, congestion of use, travel outages. You know, th that is a picture of a data center uh, on fire or like after a fire. So <laughs> things do happen, and the web should be able to uh, have an infrastructure that uh, makes it easy for the average web developer to build tools, um, to, to build applications in a way that will be resilient. Uh, basically today, only the major corporations are able to build resiliency against this. Then there's also other kinds of problems, like human problems, around you know, surprise oppression. Uh, Egypt kind of woke up one morning to the fact that the government had shut off access to the internet, and now, how could they organize? They had no way of contacting each other. All of their communication infrastructure was gone. Uh, then, there's, of course, there's also censorship and, and so on. And so this, this kind of stuff really, really matters. And when you think about the messaging tools, there's really no reason that these shouldn't work in disconnected networks. Uh, we already know, from a technical standpoint, everything we need to do to make these really critical applications work in the disconnected or offline case. Uh, it gets, so those are human problems. What about natural disasters, right? This is a big deal. All right, so if you don't care about you know, the eventualities, maybe I can convince you through pointing out that the web is getting kicked out of ubiquitous computing. Um, so we have like all of these devices uh, that we're now using from you know, tablets and phones and pho uh, watches, and soon enough we'll have like earrings and bracelets and so on that are all connected to the internet. And none of them basically, except the regular desktops or laptops, uh, really use the web. Most applications that we see in mobile are now shifting entirely to, to using the web only as a sync system and running entire application platforms that are locked down and, and closed. And this is basically taking that amazingly malleable system where somebody could just build some code and continue to update it very easily into a lockdown platform that only a few people decide whether or not something will be installed. Uh, so this is a huge step back uh, from, from where we were, right? Like the web gave us this amazingly beautiful platform where you just ship some HTML and some JavaScript and CSS and now you have a wonderful new capability that you've granted to the whole world and it's getting shut out. 
Uh, and this is because the you know, mobile browsers are kind of slow. How would you do a web browser on the, on the watch? Uh, and so on. But there's actually a deeper problem here, which is that the web model doesn't work in the disconnected case. Like, how do you deal with a website that you can no longer talk to? And so this suggests that the real problem is what we're layering the web on. We shouldn't be doing the web over this kind of just simple file distribution system that works over TCP, and you have to work really hard to put over anything else. We should be putting the web over a distribution system that can deal with the distributed case, that is offline first. And uh, this is our kind of like stats showing the usage of mobile apps versus uh, the web and so on. So this is a very real, real thing. There's of course data control. We have all of these huge applications that are gathering all this data, uh, and it's out there and theoretically is our data, sort of, but in reality they control it. And you can't actually link the data to each other. You only link to accessing the data through their application. So if you make a post on Facebook that is some important uh, piece of information that you're declaring to the world or Twitter or whatever, the link that you can give out to people is specifically a link that accesses that data through their website. So if they choose to censor it, or they go away, or you close your account, suddenly all of that data is gone. You can't link to it. This breaks the whole idea of the web. The whole point was to be able to build small pieces of information that you can interlink to each other. Not to like, rely on gatekeepers all the way and applications that design how we access things. All right, security is another problem, which is, of course, uh, how do you deal with the fact that most of the traffic is in the clear? Of course, we now have TLS and so on, but still, people break into these systems all the time and uh, you know steal data and so on. There's a f also this like <laughs> tragic situation where most web developers don't understand security, and so and the tools are not really there to help them design secure systems. So people make all sorts of mistakes all over the place, and our data gets uh, leaked, stolen, and so on. And this can be a really big problem when you think about all of the important pieces of information that you are storing yourself and you know, as an individual, organization, corporation, whatever, government, uh, think about all the information you're storing on the web and how easily it could be stolen, corrupted, changed under your feed. You, you might discover someday that all of your communications are, are slightly different. Somebody could actually sneak into your email servers and do this. Um, and, and this is kind of the fundamental problem. Uh, this is an image uh, from the uh, Snowden leaks uh, that shows how the model of the web is such that we armor the wire, and this is uh, a really good description from Van Jacobsen, actually, who is working on a project similar to IPFS, uh, and which is really, really, I'll, I'll describe it more later, but uh, he talks about how in the web today, we are armoring the wire only and not really armoring the data. And so what, what this means is that we're obsessed constantly with protecting the communication between your browser and the server, but but anybody could sneak into either your browser or the, or the server and change everything or steal it or whatever. And in reality, we should be protecting and armoring the data itself. Uh, so we need authenticated and encrypted data at rest. All right, um, the, last, the last problem. Hopefully I haven't like, filled you with fear yet um, because this one's a big one. So permanence, uh, throughout history we've kind of seen these societies that burn books as the worst, right? We've sort of seen like the, the whole idea of destroying knowledge, which is kind of what makes us human. Um, the whole idea of destroying knowledge is just abhorrent to what we think of civilization. Um, and yet, uh, on the web today, we burn books all the time. It just doesn't happen in mass, right? Like, we break links all over the place. Somebody could just be redesigning a website, break some link, and now the whole thing is gone. And every, every application that depended on that link is now broken. So though, of course, you could be searching for the content again, uh, all of the software that you built isn't doing those searches, so they're now broken. Uh, so the idealized web of documents is really a web of documents on computers specifically, on specific hosts in the network, and if you go and take those out, the whole thing falls, like the, the, all the links break. Uh, thankfully, of course, the Internet Archive has been trying to 
uh, deal with this problem by, by ingesting the, as much of the web as they can possibly get and backing it up, right? And this is a, a really critical component. But this suggests that perhaps we should be rethinking how the web is structured so that this kind of work is easier and that the web itself doesn't uh, disappear uh, on its own or accidentally. Uh, Vin Cerf has also been talking about this, which is, yeah. Hey, all the person in your illustration there is yeah. speaking here in two weeks. Like yes. Two weeks. So, so I think he, he's actually going to talk about a whole bunch of the same kinds of problems. So you'll get uh, to see this from different perspectives. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he, that's Brewster. Uh, if you don't know about the archive and Brewster's work, please look it up. It's hugely vital and important to how they, the network is today. Funny story, actually. One of the systems that we used as inspiration for IPFS uh, the source code for it was found through the Wayback Machine. Like I couldn't actually find it anywhere else. Uh, so that's there you go. Like this is this is important stuff. Uh, Vince Cerf also describes it, this as a problem of digital vellum, of like what happens when uh, we lose the ability to understand the data that we store. So we l forget about programs. We uh, or, or we lose some some program that knows how to read some format, and now we have a whole bunch of data that we can't decipher, or is a lot of work to decipher. So we should be thinking about uh, constructing applications in a way that we could um, resuscitate all the whole thing. Like we should be able to emulate every single machine that we ever build uh, by virtualizing the whole thing and being able to, to make sure that we back up all of this stuff in multiple different places in the world to prevent, I guess, some, some catastrophic scenario. Um, all right, so that's, that's it with the problems. And that was a lot, but it, it's... It's core to what this project is about, and it's important to set it as a, as a jumping off point for trying to discuss why it is critical to just upgrade the infrastructure of the network, uh, of the web specifically, and why it is warranted to do this whole work, which is to design a new protocol, think about developing it and deploying it um, to upgrade the web. Right? This isn't uh, easy, so why are we spending the time? It's because of these very, very important problems. So we're trying to make the web distributed, work offline, be permanent, be safer, move around the content smarter, and actually, surprisingly, most importantly, make it faster. Because if you don't make the thing faster, no one's going to use it. Technology gets adopted because you make some performance improvement. And that's why you make some important uh, change to the bottom line of major corporations. And they say, great, this is faster. Let's use it. And so that, if, if we don't focus on that and make it really good, uh, this whole change isn't going to happen. Uh, funnily, this whole thing started because I wanted to make things faster anyway. Uh, so it's important to start there. All right, so just like HTTP, IPFS is what we call a hypermedia transport protocol. It's just an algorithm and a program that moves around data with links. That's it. Uh, but it's, the, the cool thing about it is that it's, it's the synthesis of a whole bunch of really good ideas that have come out since the web emerged. And this is just a small selection. There's actually a lot of other good ideas that we've picked up along the way. Uh, but these kind of are perhaps the most important ones. And they kind of translate directly to a stack of protocols that we use. And so now we go into like the, the detail of what exactly IPFS is. Is this stack of protocols uh, to try and rebase the, the entire web and the application stack as it is today and move it to a, a smarter transport protocol. And we need some way to do naming. We need a way to represent the data that is offline and distributed first. We need a way to move the data efficiently and, and smartly. And we need a way to find the data. And uh, we, the, the core of IPFS is what we are calling sort of the Merkle DAG, or it's kind of like a Merkle tree. I'll describe it a little bit more. But that's really the central point uh, of this whole work. It's a data structure that changes the web from completely always mutable links to making a distinction between mutable and immutable links. If you are able to understand when a link is immutable, meaning that the content that you're pointing to has not and will never change, then you have a much better uh, possibility to be able to route the content quickly, make caches work, and, and so on. And th that actual realization um, was made many times over in many different kinds of systems that adopted Merkle linking uh, along the way. I'll describe some in a, in a moment. So that's the heart of IPFS. 
On top of that, we layer naming that's based on, on David Maziris' work. I'll describe how, how it works later. And underneath that, we just learn a lot from all the peer-to-peer -peer protocols out there to try and build a very sophisticated way to move the content as effectively as possible, but that's, that's able to take in policies from the user in terms of what, uh, where the user, what capabilities the user wants. Meaning that sometimes you want things to go fast, and sometimes you want privacy. And fundamentally, these two are at odds with each other because the way you get privacy uh, in internet protocols is by doing a whole bunch of wasted work. So oblivious routing protocols, oblivious RAM, they all work through doing a whole bunch of expen expensive computations and expensive moving around of data. Um, and so you need to be able to dial um, the, the transport uh, to understand when you want to, how you want to move things. This is kind of similar as the work of the Tor project, which is to rebase uh, or, or to, to insert Tor underneath HTTP to move around uh, the web as it is today through a privacy-preserving protocol. Turns out that IPFS layers very cleanly over Tor, so you can use it over Tor directly. Uh, but in that case, it has to be done carefully to make sure that you don't leak important information like IP addresses and so on. Uh, so this is this is the network stack uh, as we see it, which is that there's there's on top of IP and so on, uh, on top of the transports, uh, we have to deal with finding and routing content. So we can use DHTs and a whole bunch of other protocols. We have to exchange the content, but the central piece is the Merkle DAG, meaning we have to change how we we think about data, and we have to think through making it possible to do immutable linking. On that, we can layer naming and so on. But in reality, though we have made a whole bunch of protocols that you can use, the whole thing is designed so you don't have to use anything that you don't want to use. The, the, the only piece that is critical is the heart, like the core. Uh, it's that description of the data structure that allows Merkle linking. That is the, really the only piece that you really need. It's kind of like IP. When you think about TCP IP, the whole protocol got developed at the same time. But the core uh, contribution was the IP network. And similarly here, we have a whole bunch of protocols and a, a, a big stack, but they're all um, cleaned up in terms of interfaces, so you can really layer them on top of anything else. Um, and uh, like I described, uh, it should layer over Tor and ITP uh, cleanly. And we sort of see this as, the new, as a new thin layer, um, th thin waste of the internet, or rather of the web. So if, if IP is the thin waste of the, of the internet, we see the Merkle DAG as the thin waste of distributed protocols. Uh, and it turns out that it already is the, the thin waste. It's just that right now, everybody's doing it in different ways with different formats. And we're just sort of integrating them all into one system so that you can link between them. Uh, so we see this as an internet of data or an internet of data structures um, where you should be able to build applications <coughs> link them with this mutable or immutable linking, and then have them write over whatever transport makes sense for the user or the, or the developer and so on, uh, and have that be a separate discussion in term, instead of today, which is like just the same thing. You, you only do HTTP over, you mostly do only HTTP over TCP. All right, Merkle trees, how do they work? Why, why is this data structure so important? Uh, the basic idea is that if you have some piece of data that is linking to another, uh, in HTTP land, you would do um, just look, you, you would have an IP address that identifies some location. But the idea of a Merkle link is that you link things together with a cryptographic hash. So you, you use the content itself to determine the link. Um, and when you do that, uh, cryptographic hashes have, uh, it, the whole point of, crypto, of a cryptographic hash is that you cannot come up with some other pre-image that gives you the same hash. Or if you do, if you're able to come up with a pre-image um, on demand, then the whole cryptographic hash is broken and you should be able to uh, attack all sorts of systems in the network. Right? So there's this huge bounty right now for whoever wants to break SHA-256, they could run away with the whatever, you know, five or six billion dollars, which is the, uh, the, the whole worth of the Bitcoin network. It all rests on whether or not you can <laughs> break SHA-256. So if you can do that, uh, go ahead, uh, and then we can move to SHA-3. And over time, yeah, we have to upgrade, uh, <laughs> we have to upgrade hash functions. And, and this is an, an important detail that uh, we're still working on. But the whole point is let's use cryptographic hashing to address the content. Uh, and that, that's what gives you the immutability. Because if you change anything, the crypt cryptographic hash changes, and now the link is different. 
so a, let's take the web and add Merkle links to them, to it. This is the Merkle tree, which is like the first kind of Merkle ice data structure. Uh, this is where the idea of a Merkle link came out. Uh, Git uses them. This is why Git works as well as it does. Uh, data within the Git version control system is Merkle linked. Uh, Bitcoin uses it. This is how the whole blockchain operates. The whole thing is, is Merkle links. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of protocols, right? But the point is that all of them have these different Merkle links. What if we build a thing? Oh, and, and yeah, Bitcoin is like this massive, <laughs> this massive Merkle tree. Uh, whoever said that uh, money doesn't grow on trees, right? <laughs> so let's take the uh, let's take the idealized web and add some Merkle linking, and that's what IPFS is. So you can see it as a sort of massive forest of Merkle trees, where any one tree can point to any other tree. And you do this by having a common format around how you do the linking. And for those specific systems that are pre-IPFS, we'll do some, for like the big and important ones, we'll, we'll try and make them work natively. Um, and we'll have some mapping to be able to address things like Git and Bitcoin and so on, uh, so we can import all of that data. Uh, but for things going forward, it would be great to just use this one format so everything can interoperate. And that's kind of like the, the heart and core of what IPFS is about. Uh, here are sort of like a, the landscape as we see it. There's multiple blockchains. I don't know if how many people here are into dialed into the Bitcoin and blockchain world, but there's these massive Merkle trees emerging that are now running financial systems and smart contract systems, uh, meaning like legal, pseudo legal code that's executing on the internet kind of on its own um, that is mediating the transfer of property and it all relies on the, this Merkle linking. So uh, Ethereum, which is one of these important uh, blockchains that is emerging, uh, which is the one kind of focus on smart contracts, is going to be using IPFS already. So that's, that's exciting. And, and to explain why this Merkle linking is, is so valuable, uh, it's good to think about the CVS or SVN uh, transition into Git. So if you remember the good old days when people had to use CVS, uh, you had the centralized server that had all of the data uh, or, or all of the version history of, of some code. And you, and you had a system where if you got disconnected from the central server, you couldn't commit any code. So you couldn't really work when you were offline. Uh, also, if the server fell apart, you couldn't talk, nobody could do anything at all. Uh, and so Git came in and said, okay, look, let's not do this at all. This is pretty stupid. What if we put the entire uh, version control system in each of the nodes and you have an offline first system where everyone is working independently, contributing and adding immutable objects, and then over time you sync it. And this is an extremely valuable idea. If you get disconnected from the rest of the network, you can still work and operate, you can still communicate with each other. Uh, if the centralized servers fall apart, it doesn't matter, everyone can still work. And uh, this is the same thing that IPFS does, but it does it to the entire web. And this, so the whole idea is let's, let's take this, this distributed offline first data structure and use it to make the entire web. Uh, and this is what gives us the distributed web. This is why we're able to make websites and applications that link to each other, that work disconnected, that work offline, and that have no origin server. So in a sense, if you make a website on IPFS, or if you put a website on IPFS, you might need a server to have the data to seed it out, or at least one node. But it is not uh, the origin server. Uh, any server that has the data or can distribute it can do so. And the website operates wherever it executes. So if you're running the website locally, the whole rest of the network could disappear. The data could be deleted from every other computer, and you still have the code, and you still have the data, and you still operate. That is the, uh, the transition of the model. This is what I like to call hyperspeed, because uh, you're kind of beating the speed of light, right? Like you're going, uh, you're going faster than the speed of light because you're able to move content sometimes preemptively or know that content hasn't changed at all, so you don't have to connect in any way and you can reason about the content you have and not have to um, you know, waste uh, time or, or rely on links that may be off. Uh, so we call this the Merkle DAG. It's not a great name. It's kind of hard to say. We might rename this to the Merkle Web or something like it. But the idea is you have this huge graph. Everything is this directed acyclic graph where content points to each other uh, with these Merkle links. Um, and you can represent Unix files and directories over this, of course. Uh, you can get us an example of this. 
Uh, you can do Bitcoin and blockchains and so on. And you can even do arbitrary key value stores. And there's even some people that are building a SQL database on top of IPFS. So you could have like full SQL semantics on top of the Merkle DAG, uh, which is kind of cool, right? <laughs> uh, so how would you go about doing this? Well, you represent a file as a DAG node. Uh, big files will be split into multiple nodes. And so you can do chunking and duplication, right? So if you have a massive file or, or two different files that, are, that share a ton of, of data, you just duplicate it. It's the same thing that file systems have been doing for decades. Let's just put that on the web itself. Um, directories or DAG nodes and so on. Uh, and so to sh show kind of how it looks, so in, in the regular web, you would have this uh, domain name mapping to a location. Um, and so that, again, would be like you talk to a specific node and you pull it back. In the IPFS world, let's use the hash and address things by hash. Uh, so you now have a, a mapping from the name to the content, and you now can retrieve things. Uh, so any node that has the content can serve it to you. Uh, the way this works, or the reason that we have the, uh, the, the reason the format is tricky to get right is because you want to preserve two really important properties of, of the web. Uh, you want to be able to resolve paths the same way that Unix brought it up, right? You want to be able to do Unix pathing on top of this distributed web. So you want to be able to represent directories as DAG nodes and resolve links through it the, by finding the hashes along the way. This is effectively what Git does. Uh, and so the question is, if you now have this massive immutable uh, log where you're adding content all the time, and whenever you make any change, you just create more content, you still need mutability, right? So, so we've, we've gone from having pure immutable, we're gone, we've gone from a web that is completely mutable to a web that is completely immutable where changing content means creating new content because changing the bits would change the value of the hash, which means the link has to change. You still need mutability to be able to do dynamic content. Um, but turns out that people, uh, the folks over in, in uh, it, that made Plan 9 uh, came up with the, the right way to do it, which is that you use Merkle linking, but you have pointers on top of the graph. So the old Fossil and Venti file systems worked this way. So you had this, every time you made any change, you would just create more data. Um, and by the way, ZFS works the same way. You just constantly create more data. And when you want to do dynamic content, you just move the pointer to the latest version. So you need some way of having these pointers work across the whole web. And Git, again, works the same way. In Git, you have immutable objects, and you have mutable branches that you keep pointing. So the master branch is really just a file in your repository that has a hash in it. And whenever you commit, you change that value to point to something else. Uh, so right, so we can do mutability really trivially with DNS. right? So all we have to do is take a DNS text record and put in a hash there. And whenever you want to change things, you change it. But that's really expensive. right? Like We don't want to be doing mutability across DNS. Um, we want sub-millisecond mutability. Uh, this wouldn't work on its own. So we introduce a new naming system in between. Uh, and that's what we call IPNS, so the Interplanetary Name System. And this is based on David Messier's work. Uh, the first file system that came up, up with it was uh, SFS. And I, that's as far back as I've traced the idea. Uh, there, it might actually be even older, who knows. Uh, but the idea is very simple. If you want to point to some immutable content, you generate a public-private key pair, and you take the hash of the public key and hand that out as a reference. So when people are going to look up something, they, it includes the hash of the public key, uh, which means that they can retrieve the public key, and they can check that that is correct. The next thing you do is you create a pointer, which has the value that you want to point to, and you sign it with your private key. And you take that record, and you put it somewhere in the network that people can resolve it. It could be over DNS, but that's slow again. We want it to do it faster. Um, and this gives you a mutable link that you can update whenever you want by just signing the new pointer and distributing it through the network. Does this kind of make sense? This explanation is not very good, and it's a very subtle idea that has wide-reaching implications. Um, I can explain it again. How many people got that or were completely phased? Eh, sort of. Uh, so, so again, like the, uh, you take the content, you take the hash, you create a pointer, 
you sign it with your private key and you put that out there, which means that somebody can verify that it was signed by you and nobody else. Um, and then what you do is hand out a reference to it, which has the hash of your public key. So if I receive the, the link at the top with a blue link, I take that blue uh, hash, I can resolve, uh, I can find the public key and retrieve that with it. And I can then find the pointers, and I can verify that the pointer was really signed by you, so I have full mutability back. Uh, and so these are these mutable pointers that are layered on top. Of course, nobody wants to look at, look at hashes, so yeah. Sure that I have a recent copy of the pointer and not an old one. Like, uh, yeah, so you can do that in multiple ways. So uh, it turns out that you don't actually want to choose just one way of doing it uh, because there are different application models that want to support different kind of updates. So one trivial way would be to just update a counter, right? And so you you look for whatever pointers you can see and you take the highest value. Right? That's, that's one trivial way. But there are other cases where you can do ancestry chains. So one pointer can point to the last pointer. So you you scan for a while fetch a bunch of pointers, and you take the one that is the, the ancestor of all the other ones. Um, Do you have a way of yeah. Uh, yeah, so we are building this as to be entirely uh, pluggable with whatever PKI you want to use. So we don't, we don't enforce some PKI. The idea is that you can br you bring your own keys and you do whatever keys you want to, to, to use, and IPFS will work with whatever system you have. And that's an important thing because many different organizations trust different kind of cryptographic primitives, and you can't tell everyone, hey, just use these, uh, because that, that's not going to work. Um, so the point here is that uh, we have a whole set of formats that'll, that give us interoperability across different crypto systems. So the hashes here are not SHA-256, they're not SHA-3, they're actually a thing we call multi-hash, which encodes in the hash itself which function was used to generate the hash so that you can upgrade it over time. And you can do the same thing with the keys. You can describe what key it was and so on. And uh, the, the hash there, so this, is, this gets more into like a kind of like more, more esoteric stuff, but one cool result out of this is that you can take the keys themselves uh, the public keys, put them back into IPFS as immutable content, fetch them, and then link, have the entire PKI as objects here that you can find. So the, you can have an object that, that, ha that includes the data of the public key and a pointer to its parent key and a signature within it. So you can, with having only that object, you can check the key, you can fetch the parent, and you can verify that the signature is correct, and you can crawl, you can do this all the way with the whole PKI. So it, you can use the immutable part of IPFS to distribute the entire PKI, uh, and then from there you can do revocation however you want. Um, that's a whole other, like how to do revocation and key rotation are really important pieces of this whole thing, um, but there's no one answer, nobody has come up with like the one right solution, and it's mostly different camps want to use different things, so we just work with all of them. That's kind of our, our principle around all of this. Um, you won't find one solution that's right uh, forever, so you should make the thing be able to work with different people by introducing these small, simple formats that can multiplex over the other ones. It's kind of how we do, uh, we work over multiple transports that way, so IPFS can work over QUIC, can work over TCP, can work over uh, WebRTC, can work over any single transport you want, uh, because we're, we've made the whole thing self-describing. Cool. Any other questions on, on this mutability stuff? No. All right, cool. I'm going to go ahead because uh, running um, late. So what this whole thing gives you is this huge mesh of content um, that's separate from the hosts that host it. And this huge mesh of content is either linked with immutable links, which you can verify by hashing it, or linked with authenticated links, so key links, which you can verify by checking signatures. And so the, the, what it means to publish to this network is that you just create content, add it, and share the hash, or you create content, sign it, and you share the, your key. And that gives you full power to publish into the network without necessarily having to host it yourself and without having to trust any of the people that are hosting the content for you, which buys you those elusive properties, which is that I should be able to create the content and store it all over the network, and it should be able to be served all over the network, and you should still be able to check that it was truly me who published that content and that you aren't being attacked by some man in the middle 
and so on. Uh, I hear a dog quacking. It's probably uh, telling me to rush. Uh, so this, this web of data, so, so this huge mesh is, is kind of like a web of data in the same way that uh, the linked data world and the semantic web world wanted, except that instead of relying on the links being these mutable references and relying on just constant queries to all of these online servers, you can package the content up and move it to wherever it, it makes sense to be, and everyone can check the, the, check the whole content integrity on their own. And so you can, you can model web application. And so, so you, you can translate the standard websites of today directly onto this by just adding them as files directly onto IPFS, and it, it all works. And that's kind of like a critical component. To, do, to interface with all the databases that people use today, those would still work the same way, and that people still will have some RESTful APIs and so on, and that those will still operate the same way. But it gets really interesting when you start thinking about how to do dynamic content or how to build applications that really have no centralized databases. We're talking about being able to create applications where a client would generate the data locally. So for example, a Twitter client could generate the data locally. I would have a set of keys. I create a tweet or, a, or an email or whatever. I sign it locally and I distribute it through the network, and people can check that it was truly me who wrote that. Um, people can move it around however they want. And if you add encryption around the data itself, then you don't have to worry about uh, encrypting the wire all the time. You should also encrypt the wire, but the point is you don't have to worry about the data leaking necessarily, and that the data is encrypted on its own. Big asterisk there in that depending on how you encrypt things, depending on how you move it around, people could break encryption and so on. But it's a very different model for computation, right? It's a model that goes back to the distributed notion of the web, where the publisher is anybody, where the hoster is anybody, and where it's completely distributed and peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, and so we can have websites that operate entirely on the browser and have no, no, brow no server necessarily. Of course, servers are a really good idea. It makes things faster. But it should only make things faster. Uh, or maybe do some critical processing, but you shouldn't have to trust the server all the time with all your data constantly to the point where you no longer have the ability to publish yourself. Uh, and that's the sort of shift in model. Um, and you can do this. So this graph could be used for anything, right? Like you, if you really sink down, you can start creating like legal records and contracts and, and link all of these th pieces together and have just this web of data that you're checking, not necessarily worrying about the representation of the files themselves. Uh, all right, that's kind of how IPFS works. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about how the project is going, because there's a whole bunch of ideas, and we've, I've kind of just given an overview. There's really a whole bunch of pieces that we're touching. Um, and, and so where, why is this different from any other good idea out there? Why is this different from the tons of good ideas that have um, been written up and maybe implemented, but haven't really uh, you know, been uh, deployed. So we're designing the whole thing to, again, interface with the web of today. And we have like this whole sophisticated adoption plan to make sure that we can migrate to IPFS without having to, um, without, without the user under, uh, telling, right? So the first step, for example, is you run some HTTP gateway where uh, you, you can give people regular HTTP links that will resolve through IPFS, and they can pull content, and it all kind of works seamlessly. Of course, that still relies on some gateways. The next step is you ship them some JavaScript code, which runs a full implementation of the node in their browser tab. So now you have the full IPFS node in the browser tab capable of doing the entire uh, protocol and moving around the content, but the user never had to install anything. That's not as fast, so you ideally want it to be as part of the browser itself, and you can do this through um, either browser extensions, or you can do this by implementing directly in the browser. And we are wor actually working with a browser vendor, uh, a major browser vendor, on implementing IPFS in the browser, which is actually a show of traction. Like This is actually to the point where browser vendors are going, oh, this is really cool. Let's actually use it. Um, and uh, the last case, and this is where we stop it, where we are actually kind of extending the web into Unix, uh, we see IPFS more as an OS service that should be running as part of the OS itself. And if you notice the links that we had, are they don't have the colon in it, right? So if you look at an HTTP link, it looks kind of like, man, where's an HTTP link? There we go. So an HTTP link has this colon slash slash thing, and we just have slashes. 
a trivial detail, but in reality, this is what allows you to mount the entire thing in your Unix file system. And now you can write applications that are running in the regular standard process model that are actually part of the web. So you can ship code this way. You can have entire package managers this way. You can model entire file systems this way. You can model entire machines and virtual machines as just entities in this, in this graph. And so you could have your name pointing to a VM, and all you have to do is remember your one name, and you pull down the entire virtual machine, you emulate it, you defer the cryptid, you emulate it, you run it, you have all of your personal files in there, and you can now com compute. Uh, and all of, that's, all of that, what that's doing is just adding more immutable content that you're now spreading back into the network. So this is where, where, it, where it goes from parity with the web to really giving a whole bunch of new capabilities that have been known and studied in distributed systems and file systems, but haven't really made its way all over uh, to the web. Uh, cool. So there's a whole bunch of stuff uh, there that, that is really exciting and interesting. Um, but, uh, but that kind of is, is an example of how you can go about making sure that, that this thing isn't just some random idea. It's really the whole set of protocols are designed to plug into all of the other systems that are out there. So that's actually the majority of the work. The majority of work was not coming up with the ideas, was not making the core implementations. It's making the whole thing interface with the rest of the ecosystem. It's a whole bunch of tools that have to be made. It's a whole bunch of careful design decisions about whether or not to include a colon there, right? That, that could, so, so that colon, the HTTP colon slash slash, it, it's like the, this reminder that a trivial decision could make it impossible for the web to be layered on Unix, which created a rift between the browsers and the web and the file system. And so maybe by removing that colon, we can bring back the web into Unix and make the whole thing work together. Um, th that's just an example of, a, of, a, of kind of like this principle that we have uh, in the whole project, which is to make sure things integrate well and choose, make decisions based on what will cause zero friction of adoption. Uh, and we're tr really trying to get to like that zero friction of, of, of use. Um, and we, we seem to have uh, done a good job because a lot of people are, are now using IPFS. So this, this project is completely open source. Anybody can use it. Um, we have a, two implementations, one in, written in Go, one in JavaScript. Uh, people are actively running IPFS. There's between 50 to 100,000 websites now running on IPFS. Uh, they can be viewed through regular web browsers, through our gateways. Uh, or they can be viewed natively with IPFS if you happen to be running it locally. Uh, people are using it not just for the web, but for uh, file systems. So people are using it to move around uh, containers. So there's this huge effort around uh, application containers with Docker and CoreOS and so on, which is kind of virtualizing in a very thin way. And people are using IPFS to move around these large images. They tend to be anywhere between five megabytes to a gigabyte. And people are using IPFS to move them around the data center uh, because you have these, usually the typical construction there is you have some seed of data in the, in the broader internet uh, where you kind of publish these images. And then you want to ship them out to a whole bunch of machines in your data center. And you want that to be really fast. You don't want to pay the cost of, of talking to that seed outside. You want to minimize the cost to move it into your data center and then use your own machines and your own local network to distribute the whole thing really quickly. Um, so that's another use case that people are doing. We recently found out that uh, FreeNAS, which is the FreeBSD distribution for network attached storage devices, is now bundling IPFS. Uh, and they have like a pretty huge install base between 100,000 to I think maybe a million users. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but they're now going to be shipping IPFS uh, de by default, and people are going to be using it. Another set of interesting use cases is around package management. So Linux made this amazing contribution, or like the Linux community had this amazing contribution, which is let's ship code through this very well um, cleaned up ecosystem of, of carefully designed packages and signed and do the whole verification and make it really trivial to install code. Um, turns out that you can put all of those artifacts directly in IPFS. And if you are in a data center and you need to download a package, there's no reason you should be having to talk to the whole package manager and wasting all this bandwidth. You could be getting it from whatever other computer is near you um, that you happen to be connected to. There's a lot of careful policies that go into which computers should be able to connect to each other, but that's where the routing system comes in. Uh, it turns out that there are some elegant ways to construct those, those policies. 
Um, yeah, and, and perhaps like for me the most interesting piece of this whole thing is that people are now building uh, web applications that really have no origin. They run completely on the browser, um, and they, they generate dynamic content, and they communicate with each other. And it's all hosted on this huge web of content, encrypted by default. Uh, and you're now uh, mutating data without an origin, and the whole thing works uh, in the distributed case. So completely offline first. Uh, it's a huge project now. There's tons of contributors. There's uh, Last time I counted, there was upwards from 200 people that have submitted code. Um, the, the core team is very small. There's about six of us. But the reason this massive project is actually doable is that we're doing the whole thing open source from the beginning. Everything is online. Uh, all of our design discussions are up there. Anyone can come in and, and talk. And we've had a number of very interesting developments there where suddenly we had some question. We didn't really know what, what the right answer was. And someone happened to know that the right person was uh, you know, out there and had worked on this kind of thing. They just tagged them on GitHub. They showed up, solved the problem for us, and then we moved on. Right? And so this is kind of like the next, um, of course, this is kind of like simple for most people that do open source. Like GitHub is this great resource where there's this huge social network around just contributing and making code. Um, but we are living this amazing dream of being able to just pull in the right expert at the right time whenever we want. Um, and the whole design discussions, everything is there, so people can contribute any, any kind of work. There's a whole bunch of uh, interesting algorithm questions around CRDTs. CRDTs are these conflict-free replicated data types uh, where they're a perfect fit for IPFS because these are immutable data structures by design. Um, or, or rather, they're, they're immutable and mutable in the same way that IPFS is immutable and mutable. Uh, and they map very cleanly to IPFS. And the world experts on it suddenly started having a discussion in our forums of discussion around how best to layer this in IPFS, how to use IPFS to move around their content, how to build applications on it. And that is uh, what is making this whole gargantuan effort possible. Um, right, so uh, yeah, any, so again, in, in short, uh, we are trying to upgrade the entire internet and like our, our life is really about uh, this whole process of research, development, deployment uh, of protocols. And if I were to say one last thing here in this venue at Stanford where people are doing so much research uh, uh, for the network is that truly when you look at uh, the papers, we, the idealized systems are 20 years ahead of what we have deployed uh, or, or what's in use today. And there's this filter, there's a set of filters around how much of that research gets developed, uh, how much of that research gets developed cleanly in a good usable way uh, to the point where deployment actually makes sense, how many of those deployments are done correctly uh, to the point where they're actually widely used. So many times the reason great ideas don't make it to be used is that these filters, uh, which are mostly around not coming up with ideas, but rather how do you take this idea and ship it to the real world, um, these filters uh, kind of like prevent great ideas from, from distributing. And this is what we, we really care about. Uh, so we're building this organization called Protocol Labs around making sure that those filters uh, are better uh, and that many times you can just go in and realize that some implementation, if you tweak it, change the language, or just try it again, you can now make a really good system that can actually be deployed. Uh, so this is where, where I would encourage a lot of people to spend time on, uh, thinking about what old ideas are really good and just maybe it wasn't the right time, maybe the implementation wasn't very good, maybe it just didn't get deployed the right way, but in, in reality there's nothing else holding it back, and how can we upgrade the internet and the web as a whole by just uh, putting some work there. Uh, great, so that's kind of everything. Sorry, this has been pretty long. <laughs>